The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Hello and welcome to another Soccer to the Max. I'm your host, Sean Garman, here with me, as always, Mr. Eric Watkins. Let us be amongst the first to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. And after a variety of events over the last 24 hours after the first legs of the championship games, I'm proud to say I'm only half a tall boy in right now. Hey, that's uh, th- that's progress, right? <laughs> or no? It, it's amazing the kind of stuff that you can find just when you're going at your drive through liquor store. Well, I mean, hopefully, you know, you're, you know, soon you might have to pick a tier of your internet that you have to listen to this on. So if uh, the net neutrality gets repealed, so make sure that you go and sign whatever petition needs to be signed, go argue at your congressman, whatever it is that you need to do to make sure your voice is heard about net neutrality and what the dangers it presents. Seriously, I wonder if this gets repealed. This could be one of those times where, you know, you could see people storm the White House in anger. I would. Now, granted, I would be one of the first ones to be tased and or worse, but I would take one for the team in this instance. But yes, uh, getting off, let's talk, I guess, less, more global matters and talk more about soccer as the first leg of the conference finals are, are over and... You have the nil-nil draw between Columbus and Toronto. No Josie Altador, no uh, Sebastian Giovinco. And Toronto got the job done. The result, I mean, they probably would have wanted a goal, I think, out of all this. but Yeah, with that set up, Toronto really could have stood to win. I think it's better on Columbus because now a scoring draw favors them. Yeah, exactly. Any kind of goal by Columbus without Toronto not having a goal in front of them, that's going to cause a problem for Toronto because then they have to score too. Mm -hmm. And and Columbus is very capable of doing that. And now when you go back to playing your 3-5-2 that you presumably are going to play with Josie and, and Giovinco in there, this gives them more space to operate in because that's that's the problem is that they didn't have a lot of space between what they decided to do with the back four and then putting in just having Ricketts up top and deciding that you know between Drew Moore and everybody else back there, they were going to become pests. Michael Bradley, I thought, had a pretty good game uh, as well. And you pretty much had Iguain having to just keep dropping and dropping to try to create service, and that wasn't happening. No, Will Will Trap was they really control Will Trap, which that's one of the biggest things that I noticed uh, in this, and that created what what you had, which was Toronto, I think, had three shots on goal, or not on goal, three shots for the entire game, and no shots on goal. And Columbus really didn't have a lot of great chances, they had some very much towards the end. The uh, was it he, the Merrim header that goes out the crossbar. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's the clearest one. That was the clearest one. You did have Iguain find awful really in the middle of the eighteen. To that try one to... sort of actually rebounded back to him. Yeah, and then he had a clear point blank and. Nope. Whiffed. Yep. Just whiffed on that. I think you got to give Zach Steffen. I think uh, he he didn't have to rely on making some miracle saves. I, I thought for the most part Columbus's defense actually 
played well. That's not something we've been talking about much. You know, usually we're talking about Jonathan Mensah making some kind of gaffe or something, but that didn't happen in this game. So credit to them. Yeah, one more talented, spirited effort in front of the home fans. And now, who knows? They pull off something of a miracle, then they get one last shot to chance save the crew. And could you imagine if they wind up lifting the trophy? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's that's going to be a very tough pill to swallow for MLS if you're sitting there sort of almost championing the move to Austin and your MLS Cup champions are the ones that are having to play the next season, uh, knowing that it could be the last in Columbus. Did you hear about the issues with the stadium again? With no. The, the fans attending. The Now, first of all, this time there was a car accident. Then uh, It was actually, I think, uh, an ambulance? Oh, wow. Know. But that delayed some of the traffic. However, there were people that were there, and they were there early, and they were giving them problems to get in. There was only one person taking money. Uh, there's, you know, metal, there seemed to be extra security in spots where there didn't need to be. And then when you needed people, they, they were basically short staffed on a night where they knew there was going to, they knew well beforehand there was going to be a sellout. There was people that didn't get to get into the stadium at all. Oh, and okay. then, you know, now the rumors begin again that pre court and the people involved in the front office are trying to sabotage the stadium being full so that they can sit there and say that, Hey, look, this was, it was a sellout maybe by ticket sales, but it, you know, it was, certainly wasn't represented in the stadium itself and whatever it is that they want to throw out there. It, it's good that you use sabotage because I'm hearing about that. This is the first word that came to my mind. It's, this owner is using some very dirty pool, knowing that he's got Don on his side. Don. That's what's so weird about this, too. It's like, if you're MLS and you're seeing this, it's like, how can you go on and sort of defend this and be okay with it, knowing that it may not take much digging to really defraud this whole process? Yeah, I know it becomes a lot of finger pointing and he said, she said and whatever, but it's it's not a good look for the league that's already got problems with, you know, your your playoff system obviously needs tinkering. Mm -hmm. it, you were, if it wasn't for the red card, perhaps we're talking about a different game in Seattle and and Houston where perhaps there's not two goals. Uh, there was the one goal early, but then, you know, that could have been it if you didn't have the red card, or perhaps you could have had another 1-1 draw, and it goes to Seattle that way. It just, I think, certainly, with the way that things have played out, you're going to have to mess with the playoff system. Absolutely. You have so much problems with how the league is structured now. Of This has been a long time coming. You need to start taking some of the training wheels off. And then you have this thing with, with Columbus and and moving them to another city while you're sitting here about to announce more expansion teams. And you've but, got two more that you're going to announce. You've got a couple more in the works. I mean, you this... You've got the Miami one that you're going to announce at some point. Exactly. So, so th this is at a time, and then you'll have to, and let's face it, if you move Columbus to Austin, you're going to have to do like you did with Houston and Kansas City, going and try to figure out switching conferences. That's going to mess things up. And there's, for everything that's gone right, especially the last five, ten years, now MLS has put themselves in a position to where a lot can potentially go wrong. And they are poised to potentially have to take some very serious hits over the next two, three years. Certainly, but 
are, is there anybody really policing them when you know the that whole thing about U, U.S. soccer and MLS have their TV rights tied to each other? I mean, there's there's mm-hmm. a lot of that going on. So obviously th- there's a lot of support to try to have MLS succeed, but then when there's all this negativity surrounding the league right now, it's not helpful. And it going on, and and you have negativity going on when your playoffs are going on, which is the worst part. Exactly, and the fact that not only just during the playoffs, you're coming back, setting yourself up for what should be a thrilling conclusion to your playoffs after the international break, and now all of this negativity is at its peak. Oh yeah, and then it just it already has this feeling of. Do you do, do people really care that much about the MLS playoffs? Because it really feels like outside the bubble, people aren't really talking about it. No. And when you're in the bubble, the amount of people talking about it doesn't even seem like it's really that big a deal. You have the usual suspects and everything else. And, of course, we are and the people that have uh, podcasts or some kind of vested interest in it. But... It's not this big thing you would see for any other playoffs. No, and even to the point to where other playoffs have had rematches the past couple of years, or even the idea of a rematch, and you've had teams... Well, you have that for MLS, too. Yeah, and this is what I'm saying. Other playoffs have had that, but everybody focuses on that one thing. What could happen? Is this good? Is this bad? Whereas with MLS, you've got a combination of all of that. A record-setting season for Toronto FC, a potential for another classic in an MLS Cup rematch from the following the great match that was last year. So you're getting a lot of what's happened in other leagues all rolled up into one, but nobody's talking about it. Yeah, and then the, that's the thing is sort of the Columbus Crew situation is becoming the thing people are focusing on with the playoffs, which is great. It gives people a team to root for, right? Mm-hmm. But then you're sort of also rooting against seeing the Supporter Shield winner actually go up and try to finally win a championship. Uh, so that's that's another thing that kind of goes against in your against what, what you want is for the league. So... I, you know, I, I think uh, this is something that you have to consider when you're MLS that, you know, I, I just, I don't want to keep belaboring this point, but right now, you know, Toronto is set up very well to mm-hmm. go home, get a couple goals and perhaps put this one away. Uh, you have your full complement of stars aligned for you and, and there for you uh, to go against the Columbus Crew side that, hey, if they go out there and try to attack, they can get really good exposed. You know, we don't see Burhalter try to pack it in and go on the counter for that one goal or something like that. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they play that. But Columbus is certainly not out of it yet. Uh, they could, again, like we talked about, that one away goal can change a lot of things and make that game uh, very, very different, especially if it happens early uh, either way. So moving on from that to the Houston game, or the game in Houston, Seattle finally wins in Houston, uh, by the way. So that's a a big monument to them, but that's impartially, or that's partially given uh, by the... Uh, Jaleo Anibaba red card that was correctly given. It was a dog mm-hmm. so. Uh, but then a uh, terrific save on the penalty to keep things 1-0. Houston had a couple of chances, but aside from the ones early, they really didn't have much else. Uh, no. I mean, they had a couple of great set pieces those last 10 minutes, but I think by then, the fact that they had to try to chase the game and at least get one goal because Seattle had scored two away. Yeah, Seattle really could have had three, four, or five 
Oh yeah. At certain points. Because by then they were getting tremendous breakaway opportunities at the edge of the final third, and that Dynamo team was gassed. A mm. team that was normally so lethal on set pieces, the leading score when it comes to set pieces, and with the, the Sounders vulnerability, they just couldn't get anything. Yeah, Jovan Jones was a beast. Uh, Dempsey had his moments as well, and I, I think certainly, you know, that, that defense held pretty strong as well. They're going to miss Roman Torres uh, for the second leg, and then, con- you know, very consequential to Houston is Albert Delis is going to be uh, down for uh, card accumulation as well. So each side missing an important cog uh, in that machine and it's going to be interesting to see how they cover for that. Houston certainly would have really liked to have been able to use the least because you need to be able to score. You need to be able to take any advantage you can. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes, they did go up to Portland and score too, so it's very possible that they could do that. But I just can't see Seattle not scoring at home at least once. No, and especially the fact that they've got Jordan Morris back they took Dempsey off at the half so they could limit his minutes, knowing that they're going to need him for the second leg. Everything is working in Seattle's favor. Now, I will say that uh, Roman Torres' yellow was kind of stupid, but I don't think uh, Seattle missing Torres is going to hurt as nearly as much as Houston missing Elise. Yeah, exactly. Uh I mean, they could certainly miss Torres, especially on the headers, the clear, mm-hmm. on the corners, all that. They're going to miss Torres, but I think, like you said, not having a lease is going to be an issue when you need that scoring. And uh, we'll see how that goes in about a week's time. I think certainly staying in the Cascadia, there's a news from both of the other Cascadia teams. Something we haven't talked about, it's been in the news for a while. It's just every time we were going to do a show, something would happen and we just decided, all right, let's just wait until after the the first leg of games are over. Caleb Porter, in a mutual agreement between Portland front office and him, uh, out as uh, the head coach, the manager, whatever you want to call him, for the Portland Timbers. And he perhaps won't take a job for a while. There was rumors going around about FC Cincinnati, but that's already been debunked and debunked hard. Even Taylor Twelman made a huge deal about it. Just to prove a point, and I think he's right about that. It's... I hope it's not anything U.S. Men's National Team related because I just don't – that's not the person that I really want to see going back to that well. Uh, I mean, to be fair, when the Olympic failures happened, he was still the coach at Akron. It's not like he had all the experience he has now, so you got to give him that credit. But it's just – I I just – I feel like it's going in the wrong direction at that point. I don't know. Uh, there's already people that are being talked about, especially uh, San Francisco Delta's coach and, you know, championship winning coach uh, Dos Santos, Mark Dos Santos, possibly coming in there. Uh, you know, I'm sure that they will cast a wide net being one of the more marquee teams in MLS. They might get international eyes and and all that. And maybe, maybe Big Sam decides to go to Portland instead of the national team. You know. And especially with the season that Portland has had, you know, top seed in the West, hard-fought series against Houston in the conference semifinals, you still got large chunks to where you could build upon and maybe make a run towards another MLS Cup for that franchise. So not just it draw, drawing international eyes from that aspect, but it's a good job. And you can win right away if you play your cards right. Yeah, I I think yeah, you definitely have the roster here for that. It's just who do they get in? 
And it'll be interesting to see how long they wait until they, they get a manager in because we're seeing uh, another team already making moves without a manager being hired. I mean, we don't know if they're talking to someone and they're making it in, in his name or anything, but we'll see how that goes. Vancouver also decided to do away with their Vancouver 2, and they made a affiliate agreement with uh, Fresno FC for USL instead. The only thing I can imagine is that they save a lot of money by doing mm-hmm. this because other than that, I mean, why wouldn't you want to have your own team that you are controlling everything that's happening and you can set what what goes on, who plays, that kind of thing, who you want to look at. You don't have to go through any kind of rigmarole. But it must have been a serious enough problem for them to, to have to change that. If it's a point to where Vancouver 2 was bleeding money, which sometimes can happen, depending on... Well, plus, on... you got to remember, the people aren't going... The, the, there's not a whole lot of people going to these games. You're talking about, no. like, 100 people, maybe? Yeah, and for something like that, would you rather have 100 people show up and you're bleeding cash, or to where... Okay, you can maybe have a hundred, five hundred, a thousand, whatever it is for Fresno, so they're getting extra revenue and you're saving yourself quite a bit. Maybe you can use that money for other purposes. Yeah, exactly. Like focusing it on players. Exactly. For your actual first team. I think also the the team that I mentioned, uh, Colorado. Of course, there was, we talked about them signing the, I guess, still current or possibly former uh, New Zealand national team manager uh, not too long ago. They did, they still have not decided on that, but they have decided to bring in a player, uh, even with him not, not having uh, a coach, which is very weird. Right? I mean, you're signing players, but you don't have a head man to be, you know, talking to him. and. So you don't bring in the postmaster general, and you don't bring in a regular mailman either. You bring in someone else. Colorado, I get that your season's over, but you need to lay off a few things for a little while. Get this right first, and then resume. Yeah, so they signed the Swedish uh, attacking midfielder Johan Blomberg from AIK. He's 30 years old. Uh, he's spent his entire career in Sweden. He has 28 goals, 39 assists for three different Swedish teams. Uh, he has to get his ITC in order, but obviously you'd assume Colorado is going to try to make changes because they don't want to be you know, at the bottom of the league again in, in the Western Conference, but still, it, it's just really weird that you're making decisions without a manager, but, you know. And, I mean, it, it's very likely that Anthony Hudson will be the the coach, and perhaps they're just, you know, they, they haven't officially named him and they were waiting for the whole thing with uh, the the Peru and New Zealand game to clear and all that stuff. But, it's, yeah, I just thought, why not just name him and then you name Blomberg the next day or something? Yeah, so I, I, I completely agree. It's because you're making the right decisions for how you want to do with your player personnel anyways. I... Uh... It's confusing, but at the same time, it's Colorado. Yeah, I mean, trying to understand what Colorado does sometimes can be a bit of a headache. But the LAFC adds their third player to their roster, and Bob Bradley knows him well from his time as the uh, manager for the Egyptian national team. Omar Gaver from FC Basel is, goes on loan to LAFC. Of course, uh, if you watch Champions League on Wednesday, 
You saw Basel score a late goal to Ooh. keep themselves alive in the Champions League group stage over Manchester United. So, uh, of course, Basel or multiple times. I know you can keep booing, but I'm trying to just forget that that happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> Whoa, the, uh, you, I can't forget that happened. I can't touch a Danish. Now, thankfully, I don't eat Swiss chocolate, but do you know how many watches I own? Oh, oh my Toblerone God. is so good, though. <sighs> Toblerone is so good. But, yeah, I mean, Basel multiple-time champions of, of the Swiss League. And, and not not this season. Young boys are leading them by a lot. But he's still, he's 25. He brings a very good pedigree that obviously Bradley knows him. Uh, you're, he's a discovery player using TAM to to pay for him, so it's not costing a lot of money. It's smart for LAFC on this one. Yeah, they're making better and better decisions, and if they keep this up, I would love to see when this team takes the pitch their first year and see how they do, not just versus the Galaxy, but how they do in the West. Yeah, certainly. Uh, that's going to be a, uh, I mean, for the Galaxy, for the league, they're going to want to see LAFC succeed like we saw with Atlanta and even Minnesota to an extent, you know, who are deciding to make, they're going to be more aggressive this offseason in scouting. They've already been to Columbia and watching games over there. And uh, it seems like Adrian Heath is is understanding, all right, we tried to make it through the first year. Uh, we did okay, all things considered. Let's let's try to get better and and scout better and everything else. And I think you got to come in Minnesota for for doing that. Yeah, th- they realize, especially with Heath's style, he did the same thing in Orlando. Let's just hope that for Minnesota's sake, he has a better faith this second year. I mean, it seems like there's a team willing to improve. And with the ability to improve. Now, I'm not going to make the jump and say, oh, they're going to automatically be in a playoff position this second year. But I think he's going to get them a lot closer. Yeah, I think Minnesota can only, I don't see them getting worse. I see them improving just because Adrian Heath does have that track record. And not only that, it's just they played really pretty well at times for being the expansion team and a lot of people and they've really made strides in that transfer window to get better and understand that okay we, we were having an awful first start of the season and they were able to improve as time went on so got to give them a, a lot of credit on that not to be outdone Real Salt Lake is in the news not for player the seasons but for an entirely Different team in another entirely different league, the NWSL. We all saw Lake takes over. Opera, well, basically they close. Just to be fair to things, they closed down, ceased operations for FC Kansas City, who had been in trouble, and they have Raw Salt Lake replace them and take Kansas City's players. They now become the fourth MLS team to own an NWSL team with Portland, Houston, and Orlando City uh, being the others. They're going to join the league next year, and uh, Craig Weibel will be their general manager for the time being until they're able to line up head coaches and GMs and and all that. I mean, this seemed to be kind of happening out of nowhere, but I feel like this is a good thing for NWSL. Yeah, with the instability and in ownership in Kansas City, and you're going from one team in an MLS market right to another, and how they're doing it, reaching out to the players, talking about who wants to come, how they're setting up with the draft, they're doing this as clean as they can, which for the league overall is good. But you combine that with some other news and 
you don't want the league to appear shaky as all has been well these past few years. Certainly, I mean, they've been trying to get more stable time on. We saw with the Western New York Flash, they became North Carolina, and they made it all the way back to the the final, only, get, only to get beat by Portland. So things can happen, and we've seen it happen quick for these new teams to come in. You would hope it's the same for Ralph Salt Lake, but then now there's, uh, thanks to 442, News coming out about Boston, the Boston Breakers being in trouble in that the league is trying to get them a new ownership group, but that ownership group may not be able to take over the team quick enough to start the 2018 season, which may make it to where they don't play the 2018 season. If they can't find some kind of in-between or an addition or anything like that. So it's... It's certainly, it's frustrating, I think, for the league that you have teams that want to move on and they they want to start progressing things. But then if you're you're having instability, this is difficult for them to get out of the first phase and into the second. Yeah, and especially with the big market like Boston, and if you're in WSL, you start losing big markets, that's a sign that you're going from stable to fledgling. They don't want to do that now. So I hope this gets resolved before this gets too ugly, because if it does, then 2018 is going to be very awkward. Yeah, certainly. I just... You got to remember, Boston hasn't been doing that well in the league lately. I mean, for the last three or four years, they've been at the bottom. They were ninth this year. Obviously, they had injuries, but especially Roosevelt uh, didn't help things. But still, uh, the team had has been having a rough go of it for a while. And th- I mean, I'm glad at least the league is understanding. Okay, we need to change things here. And we we need to we, we need to do something. We need to help this team so they can keep going. So we can have ten teams, ten strong teams uh, mm-hmm. in this league. And I, I hope for their sake. I don't want to be covering a team with an odd number next year. And and just Boston Breakers is the only team that's been through every every other women's league. Uh, so you don't want to see that history go away. Even if it's for one year or possibly permanently, if you if you can't get things figured out, it just that would really suck to see, honestly. It it really would, and especially you just mentioned Boston has a great history. You want to see that continue, and I've covered teams or leagues with an odd number of teams before. It's not pretty. Scheduling is a nightmare. It's a hassle. And at least the one benefit is it's happening now when we're at Thanksgiving. So you still have some months to decide what's going to go on before the season kicks off. Oh, yeah, certainly. Besides, those players also miss out on playing for a season. I don't know how they would deal with that for as far as, you know, would they allow those players to, to go play for other teams or how they would, you know, deal with that. But you've got some, and I mentioned Roosevelt, but you have a uh, Amanda DaCosta that wouldn't get to, to play uh, Natasha Dowie. I mean, uh, Adriana Leone, who we saw play for Canada not mm-hmm. too long ago. I mean, you've got some, some big players that would at Margaret Purse, some uh, Angela Salem that we've seen uh, Rachel talk about extensively. I just there's a lot of players there that would not get to they'd be missing out unless they let them go to another team for the season or however that would work. So you you have to hope that 
they're able to stay in Boston for one because they can get another ownership group that can move them as well, just like we saw with Kansas City where they folded. That's another thing is if they move them, then here's another team that moved. I, I just hate to see that, you know. Yeah, so do I, and timing. But then, is what do you make of the whole thing with the attendance, right? Because their attendance has been averaging around, you know, twenty five hundred to three thousand. I think they only went over three thousand once during the season this year. So yeah, I, I don't know if it's a thing with marketing. I don't know if it's a thing with where they play. Try to see what can be fixed in house. Yeah, which they played in two different stadiums. That they played in the the main Harvard Stadium. They've they've played in an adjacent field to the Harvard. Uh, so it, it hasn't really seemed to matter where they play. They've had these similar issues, and that's a problem. A big problem. I just hope that we hear more good news because it seems like with uh, American soccer in general, we're either hearing teams folding, teams moving, teams, you know, being ousted from where they are, or it's expansion. And it, you know, and it's, it's like one extreme or the other, not anything just in the middle or just let let's have some some normal off-season stuff going on. Exactly. The focus hasn't been what's going on on the pitch itself. I don't Which know. That's a problem, and that's a huge problem in itself right, that we already talked about with MLS. Mm-hmm. In that, it, even a, and it's reaching other parts of American soccer where we're talking about other things besides what's on the field, and it's at the end of the day, it can't be anything good for the league to, for either league I mean the, the positives of Real Salt Lake getting to be in the league and uh, getting to bring that name in there for them is, is really good but then you're hearing about Boston it's like ah, one step forward and one step backward yeah you're really not going anywhere uh, it, it's weird to say when the most stable league Really, in American soccer is your indoor league, and even that's been going on with some intrigue thanks to competition. See, things always happening. Uh, feels like you always got the. The thing is, you wish you weren't having to talk about the Columbus Crew situation. You wish you weren't having to talk about the Boston Burger situation, but we are. Or the FC Kansas City situation too, because they have some terrific players that now, okay, well, I mean, we got to remember what these these players make, right? They're not making a lot of money to then nope. have to all of a sudden move from Kansas City to Utah. Uh, that's not a that's not a joke. No, you know? you're moving a time zone. You're moving to altitude, and let's face it, Salt Lake City, it's got issues. <laughs> what are those then if you're going to say it has issues oh without going into too many specifics it's Mormon related and you're going to if you're the right person get some very interesting on the street encounters interesting yeah, I it, it's a funny story I got to tell you off air. All right, so we got two more things that one that could involve an MLS team and one that it just involves MLS as a whole and then we'll finally uh, talk about some something that's going to affect all of CONCACAF uh, because we haven't talked about that either. Uh yet. So new report uh Soccer America has it on on their website. It's from the Chicago Tribune about uh, Sterling Bay, a Chicago developer, uh, wants to build a sports and entertainment stadium on the Chicago River with a USL team in mind. Now, the Chicago Fire did build a complex, uh, indoor and outdoor soccer complex and clubhouse on that same Chicago River 
a couple of years ago, but their stadium is still in Bridgeview, mm -hmm. you know, which is away from uh, that part of the city. And to find out that by 2020 you're going to have a USL team playing where you you'd want the fire to be playing ideally seems kind of weird. It seems very weird. In seeing that rendering, I have one problem. It is way too shiny. <laughs> well, the sun is glaring on it. That makes it even worse. I look at that and I'm thinking, hey, wait a minute. Did I take something? I don't, Things don't normally look like this. But, I mean, and even going to with what you just said, it looks yeah, like... A 20,000 seat setting with a retractable roof? Yeah, it's like if you can maybe expand that a teeny bit, why not work a deal with the fire so they could move there? And uh, his quote is that there are a lot of cities with two soccer teams, New York, L.A. being two of those. They can certainly have two teams in Chicago. Yeah, but they're two MLS teams. L.A., two MLS teams. Well, perhaps, you know, they'll just have a affiliate deal with each other. Ah, uh, that could work, but if I'm working something like that, that there's a lot the more that has to be ironed out. I wouldn't well, plus, want to imagine if Chicago winds up getting that Amazon HQ, that's where that's supposed to go, apparently, as well. So that would be a huge booming center that the fire would be missing out on. If only that USL team gets to play there. Yeah, and that's why I would say, if I'm doing that, I'm saying, hey, you get to be a, an affiliate, but we get to play there too. Otherwise, we'll kick you to the Bridgeview curb. So, I, I hope that doesn't become a crap storm, but there's a lot that has to go down here. Certainly, and I wanted to bring this up because it's a nice... Uh... Well, how about we do this at the end? Because this is a concept. It's not something that uh, is set in stone. So the last thing, because we haven't talked about it yet, is the idea of the CONCACAF Nations League has been officially put out there. And it's going to happen September 2018, very much like the Euro European, the UEFA uh, Nations League, uh, because... You have to be different, right? The UEFA Nations League and the CONCACAF League of Nations. Jeez, guys, go on. Uh, so both of them will start at the same time. All 41 member nations of CONCACAF will get competitive soccer matches in the region, which is the main reason why you're doing this. Uh, the 41 countries will be in the three tiers with separate leagues based on the country's respective soccer levels. Uh, it will be a proposed to be set up similar to a domestic club league. Uh, and then you're going to have promotion and relegation. Uh, I think it's it, within two years of doing it. Mm -hmm. And Cause this if also you're... serves as the qualifying for the, the Gold Cup as well. Yeah, because if you're doing it like the UEFA Nations League is tying it within qualifying for Euro 2020, then yes, it's going over a two-year format. So it would be starting after the World Cup, but your first Nations League final wouldn't be until June of 19. Then you would start up again in 20 for a final in June of 21. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Well, I'm assuming the final would be the Gold Cup because you still have the Gold Cup every two years. So, well, well, well with them it would be the Nations League final, but as the Nations League is settled out, you have your qualifying tournament for Euro 2020, and from your Nations League, you have a qualifying playoff to make sure your lower tier teams qualify for Euro 2020. Now, how they would do it here in Nations League, or the CONCACAF League of Nations, God, you're right, that does sound stupid. 
regardless, how they were doing in CONCACAF is different. We might not necessarily be seeing a biennial gold cup anymore. I wonder if they would do that. That's it'd be nice to see that happen, but it's again you're this obviously would create a lot of money for Conga Calf, which I guess could offset the having the two gold cuts, but we'll see if they what what they decide to do here. I, it, what do you say to the whole? Now you do still get the friendly dates in March, so you do still get a couple of friendly dates where you know the mm-hmm. U.S. could play a European team or whatever, like we saw with the Portugal game. Right. Do you think this is detrimental to the U.S., Mexico, those kind of teams, Costa Rica's, that you're only playing CONCACAF? I really think so, because you say that you're organizing it in your three divisions. Your first division would have 12 teams. Your second division would have potentially 14. Your third division would have the remaining 15 Look at your top 12 CONCACAF teams. U.S., Mexico, Costa Rica, obviously your top three. And then you maybe you throw in a Panama, maybe Honduras, Honduras yeah. Trinidad and Tobago. And then you're going down to potential Jamaica. Jamaica and then... Now you're scraping up teams like Guatemala and a few others just to fill out that first El Salvador. Team. El Salvador, okay. You're doing all that to fill out your first division. That's not doing you any favors. It's doing more favors for your Jamaica, El Salvador, all the other countries that I've mentioned going up against teams like U.S. and Mexico more often. But for U.S. and Mexico, it's going to hurt. Yeah, certainly. And you do always have an, uh, you always end up having a couple of friendlies a year where you're playing Panama. You're, I mean, Mexico and the U.S. always play each other in some kind of friendly. So mm-hmm. why not have it be in this kind of thing? I don't have a problem with it so much. I mean, yes, I think we would all like to have those friendlies against, you know, those. But those European teams are playing each other in the Nations League. Right, so it's so, not going to be taken away anyways, so right. I get that, but let's I mean, yeah, you could play CONCACAF, te- you could play African teams, you could play Asian teams, that, that could also help you as well, but I, I don't think this is such a bad thing, because I think f- eventually for me, what I see happening is that Carnival will eventually join, and then it will it will even itself out. Especially for that first tier, because you'll have to bump some of those teams down to the second tier, mm-hmm. and some of those, uh, some of those, uh, you know, like the Venezuelas and and the uh, Bolivias of the world will be bumped down to the second tier, so they'll get to play, and those teams in the second tier will get to benefit from playing those teams, and you know, the U.S. and Mexico, and we'll get to play the Brazils and Argentinas and. Uruguay's and all that, and I mean that that's certainly beneficial to you. Now uh, that so. will be more than beneficial, and if you're adding in all ten of the Conmebol teams, now you're instead of at forty one, you're at fifty one, roughly the same size of UEFA. So now you can really model it after the UEFA Nations League, and instead of three tiers, you can have four. Right. I mean, you would still have your separate qualifying for the World Cup or whatever, but this would certainly oh, yeah. help. Uh, it would certainly yeah. help. Uh, now, you know what would really be interesting if CONCACAF and CONMEBOL were to work together on this? Have your separate confederations qualify for the World Cup, but do like the UEFA Nations League is doing and use the CONCACAF, CONMEBOL, your Pan American League of Nations, qualify for, say, a true 16-team 
Copa America, like what we saw with the Centenario. Yeah, like the Gold Cup and Copa America pushed, smashed together, basically. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if they would do that because then you're also – this is the first time ever you would be excluding some of those, you know, the Venezuelas and me being from that country. I'd hate for them to like, oh, okay, we never, we've never seen them in the World Cup. Oh, now we won't even get to see them in the Copa America either. And like, you know, now we get to see them in the League of Nations I think more often or however that would work. But mm-hmm. I think – it just, I think it would suck for that country to say, well, unless you're hosting Copa America that year, you know, we will, we'll never see it. And how would they, they, you're now alternating Copa America with Mexico, the U S plus all those other South American countries too. How would that go? You know, would they be okay with that? You know, would they make it a, maybe a 20 team thing instead of 16? No, so you that you can still off. have all ten carnival yeah. and you have ten from Concacaf or something. Then, then again, you do like what UEFA does and bump it from sixteen to twenty-four. I wouldn't entirely object. You could do twenty-four, but geez, you're really basically everybody that's anything in Concacaf is getting in. Hey, look at what happened with UEFA. It works. Yeah, but you're talking about all 10 Conable and then 14 CONCACAF. So you're talking about, all right, U.S., Canada, Mexico, Costa Rica, Honduras, and uh, somebody else always getting in. That's six to make 16. Then you're saying like Jamaica always gets in or it's like there, uh, there's not hey, a lot of competition anymore for the I got Caribbean. Jamaican, look, you're the one talking about Venezuela. I got Jamaican blood. Okay. Give me something here. I'm trying but, to, but that's what I'm saying though. Like that's the, the only thing you got to think about is, okay, it's good for those nations, right? That you're always getting in, you're going to be in this thing. But then those real small minnows, I mean, I mean that is kind of cool, too. Like, exactly. the ones that end up making it, like the Martiniques and the French yeah. Guianas, you now get to play freaking Brazil, maybe. I mean, that's kind of cool. Exactly. Look at teams and even teams that we don't talk about. Like, say, if after Puerto Rico rebuilds, they get a team together. Or other teams like Belize. You never know. I have Belize has made waves before. See? Yeah, uh, I think I, I really like the idea of it. I want to see it in in principle. I want to see the final decision of where the standings are going to be, who's in what tier and everything else, and see how this is going to work first. But for the most part, the concept seems to work well. We've already seen with the UEFA one, that that looks really interesting. So yeah, Let the bidding commence, I guess, to see how they're going to do that. And yeah, I think the last thing talking about bidding, actually, I thought uh, Paul Tenorio brought up a, has a great article on 442 discussing the idea of what if MLS allowed teams to spend cash to acquire players within the league instead of doing, I mean, you could still use GAM and TAM and all that, but let's say, okay, let's, let's take for instance, a Hughes is Kyle Laren in the example, in the article saying, mm-hmm. okay, what if LAFC just told Orlando, okay, we'll give you 5 million for Kyle Laren. And then, okay, MLS gets their cut, right? But then that money gets invested back into Orlando, the bulk of it, and then you can use that to buy another player instead of saying, and then you still have your GAM and TAM and and whatever to use for other players, and you successfully were able to negotiate perhaps getting more money out of him than you might have gotten from MLS for a, 
outside of MLS team. He stays in MLS so you don't lose the star. And he gets the money that he wanted. But MLS doesn't want this kind of system, which is dumb. I, I don't understand. They're saying if MLS doesn't want two teams entering a bidding war over a player. So? Which, I don't understand that. Like, that that makes your league better. Just, I, 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 exactly. You have any idea how much strategy and planning would go into the off season? We see this all the time in European leagues. And to be honest, even with the top main players, you see very few actual bidding wars. You say, okay, this is what we feel we could get on the market. And then you had teams scramble together to get that money together. And then it filters down five, six, seven, eight teams deep. When well, you have that same approach in MLS, that could filter down two, three teams deep. So this, it could work. It really could work. And if you're really trying to be on a global level, like Don Garber has said he wants, you've got to do this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just, I feel like it's mainly to protect the owners that are kind of like, oh, but I don't want to have to spend big to get like big players. Well, if you sell some of the other players, the, that accumulation of money you can use to buy the one big player that you want. Or you can enter that bidding war with another team or whatever. And and if you're worried about, oh, overpaying for some guy that wasn't good, then you know what? You need to you need to sit there and and you need to figure out if you got the right GM then. If you're spending a million on a guy that sucks, well then you need to pay the price for that, right? But that comes in time. Yeah. And you won't know unless you give it a try and, and see if it works. Exactly. And I mean, I don't know what the owners are so, so afraid of, especially being. Well, they're worried about these owners that are willing to spend more money on their teams than, say, like a Robert Kraft or uh, the, the, you know, the Hunts or or any of these other owners that say, okay, we're we're going after. We're we're using our homegrown talent. We're we're trying to we're trying to build with the team that we already have. We don't want to be spending a bunch on new players. And well, if you and, don't, you don't. But you know that there are going to be some owners that do. At least know that you're protected in a lot of ways by being a single entity model. So that way you don't have owners that are completely going nuts and buying teams like you would see in Europe. That wouldn't work in MLS either. This is set up for it to be a much more efficient, balanced system than you would see anywhere. MLS just has to give it the green light. Yeah, MLS does have to give it the green light, but will they? Apparently this has been talked about, but it never gets out of the committee stage. And that's weird. Like, why wouldn't you give it a test run and and see how it goes? Did yeah, you just well, take it off the table the next year. Exactly. Who's really blocking the process? Because you think a lot of things initially just die at the committee stage. Next thing you know, they're a reality, and you wonder why do they wait so long? Who knows? Soon, at this rate, we may be talking about this even in terms of a FIFA Global Nations League. And then everybody's going to just be looking at that old way and laugh. MLS doesn't want to have that sort of a stigma or history when it comes to buying and selling of players. Plus, you want to be taken seriously. You want to be able to be involved in that global market. What if you ever do change the calendar? That's one of the things that's going to make you look really bad is, okay, you have the single entity, but you can't even make cash deals in your own league everything has to be a trade or tam or gam or whatever stuff that like people from the outside have no idea how to understand that not to mention people that are watching your product going what the hell is all this why can't you just pay 
like what we saw Lukaku, what happened with Lukaku, or Manchester United just said, okay, here's $75 million. We'll take him. Exactly. And I mean, honestly, if you go to this cash transfer system, it might be a lot better, and this could be what owners are scared of. You go to a pure cash system, you get rid of Gam and Tam altogether. Well, yeah, they don't want that to go away because they don't want that having to use all this money from your own. They want MLS to have money in the coffers, right? So, and I get it. They're trying to protect the league or whatever, but this league's been around quite a while now. You're doing expansion. I don't know what you're waiting for, but you got to yeah. start taking some of these, yeah. uh, and these especially- restrictions off. Look at the expansion fees you're getting. If you were still like you were 10 years ago, getting five, 10 million for new clubs to enter the league, I could see the hesitancy. But now you're talking 150, 200 million dollars. Come on, money is flowing in. Keep it flowing. Yeah, exactly. So. But I, I think that's going to do it, I think, for us here. Oh, we we talked about everything, I think, that was on the agenda. We'll have to see what happens uh, by the next time that these we'll, – next time we have a show. Uh, Wait I, a minute. I just got an idea. Okay. okay. Oh, I'm going to explain this really quickly because I can. Okay. Major okay. League Baseball, how it roughly works – when they're getting players from specifically Japan, okay, you enter a negotiation stage to where we're going to pay X amount of money for this player. Now, in recent years, they have put a cap on essentially buying these players and negotiating and getting contracts at $20 million dollars. Rather than, you know, 50, 60, 70 million. If MLS owners are that scared. Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with putting a money cap on it. Let's say Slaton comes in here, right? I know he's a DP. That'd be different. He's a DP, but. Yes. Let, let's say he comes in here and he finds out that there's some stupid cap on how much he could make. Well, and, no, not, not necessarily. And like you're 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 having two teams go into that bidding war, but they can only go over this much money. You think he's going to fiddle with that? Well, That's, it's not a so much a cap on how much the player could make, because really how the posting system is, how much of a cap on it is just to talk to that player. Then you sign him to whatever contract you damn well please. Well, here's the problem with that is MLS has to be involved in those contracts and has to say, well, you can pay him this. Or, you know, oh, wait, like, you know, you can't. This is what the DP thing is, right? You have a certain amount. Like, this allows you to go over the amount that we allow you to pay for a player or whatever. They don't even have real free agency, for God's sakes. They need to get that fixed, too. Oh, yeah. This whole, have, this whole have, you got to be 28 and have eight years of service in the league. What the hell? Like, no. You should really be able to kick in free agency after, I would say, three years. Exactly. Yeah, because most most players – and that whole age restriction for free agency is the stupidest thing because mm-hmm. a lot of players, they might go to Europe before you go to the eight years. So like what? Okay, they come back and they can't st- – they still can't be a free agent because they weren't eight years in the league. They they did five years and they cut off, so they have to do three more before they can be a free agent. That's just so dumb. Yeah, and the, the, the age restriction is the worst part. MLS is the only one that I've known, only league that I've known – that has a age restriction on free agency. Others have age restrictions as far as contracts, which right, is a good idea. which is normal. Right, but not free agency. That is just asinine. But anyway, 
I had to throw that idea as it popped into my head before we signed off. <laughs> it's interesting. I'm sure there will be more that comes out about this and see if this gains any steam. Just like there's been so much talk about the playoff system that there has been steam that's gained in the MLS offices about changing it. And then, of course, the, the games that happened on on Tuesday did not help matters. No. So we'll, we'll see if those return legs do anything to help that cause. And then we'll know who our NL MLS finalists are uh, the next time uh, we have a show for you. Unless something big happens that we have to do a show on Sunday. But we'll probably be back uh, the night of the conference final second legs. And we'll break that down and talk whatever else has been going on. Until then, enjoy your Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy that with your families. Be safe, uh, please. And uh, don't get too crazy on Black Friday. We're all human. There's no need to run people over and go crazy on the employees and all that stuff. You the can get the TVs for 30% off right after the Super Bowl, just like you would Black Friday. Calm down, everybody. Yep. All right, until then, we'll see you later. Peace. The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.